And welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, Shadow Minister for Innovation and Industry, Sophie Mirabella. The head of Leo Burnett Advertising and Gruen Transfer Regular, Todd Sampson. The creator of the Kevin07 campaign, Neil Lawrence. Minister for Health and Medical Research now, Tanya Plibersek. And commentator and spin doctor, Sue Cato. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. And as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 News Radio. And you can join the Twitter conversation with the hashtag that just appeared on your screen. Well, our first question tonight comes from Caitlin Diggins. My question is for Neil Lawrence. As the creator of the successful Kevin07 campaign, how would you sell the Prime Minister now, especially given his former colleagues have called him a dysfunctional, selfish saboteur? I think that um, I'm not sure how much selling or remaking Kevin Rudd uh, really needs. It's as if he's sort of been preserved in aspic from when he was elected by the Australian people. And if you look at the polls that have come out over the past few days, he's just sort of really taken up where he left off. Um, it's as if the Australian people went, something very odd happened, oh, Kevin's back, and their, their feelings towards him seem to be very similar, their attitudes towards him. So I think talk about remaking Kevin is actually off the mark. He's just picked up from where he... What does he, he I mean, what, is, what does he need to do to prove to those people who thought he was dysfunctional and a difficult leader, someone who couldn't handle cabinet processes and all of that sort of thing? Thank well, I think it, it doesn't have to do this to the... Um, the population, on the whole, don't see him that way. Certainly his own party does and probably the, the broader parliamentary party and, and the press. So I think uh, it's really an internal thing that he needs to be much more collegiate and be seen to be much more collegiate, and he's certainly making all those noises, and I think he really has to do that. But as far as the, uh, the broader population are concerned, I think that sort of went past them. Todd, you're trying to get in there? I think he's a unique product to sell, because, you know, as they say, he's loved by the people and hated by his party, which basically oh, means he's God, loved by those that. that don't know him <laughs> and hated by those that do. Uh, so I, I think... Well, the public I, feels they do know him. Yes. He spends such a lot of time in their company. If I, I think that he should go early. Because I think, like most products, the longer people think about a purchase, the less likely they are to make it. I think the longer they think about Rudd, the less likely they are to make it. What do you think his shelf life is? Uh, well, put it, <laughs> not much, but I, I, I think Rudd's biggest strength is social media. He's got 1.3 million followers. Tony Abbott's got 330,000, so he's got 10 times the amount of followers. And if you think of the network effect, he probably speaks to nearly all of the adult population it every time Ten times the three million, I think. Yeah. So. No, but he's... He, yeah, he's got a lot. Yeah. It, but, <laughs> but with the network effect, he's even... not he's even, right? No, but he's, even, he's talking to more than that. He's yeah. talking to a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, Sue Kato, let's hear your perspective. Another professional on the panel. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? We hear all of these people saying that Kevin's hated by the parliamentary party, but, I mean, clearly that's not the case. Clearly, there have been a lot of people um, through, you know, the years who've actually supported him and believed in him. So, I mean, it's an easy populist thing to, to get up that he's hated by everyone in his party, but I think it's bunkum. And, look, ultimately, what's it going to take? It's going to take him performing in a way that he's saying he, he will be, which is collegiate working with his colleagues. You know, I think this electorate, all of us, are at, can see, you know, authenticity when it's out there. And that's what they respond to with Kevin. And ultimately, you know, if he's not listening to his colleagues, we'll hear about it. So let's see. Sophie Mirabella. Well, I, I think I'd have to agree with the gentleman on the panel that um, yeah, Kevin Rudd is the same and is there. And we only had a couple of weeks ago someone who's now serving on his front bench saying he can't govern. And we really need to look at what really happened. What really happened? Why did the Labor Party get rid of Kevin Rudd. It wasn't the polls. It was the extraordinary paralysis that the government had found itself in. And he couldn't work with colleagues, as one, one of them said. He had contempt for the parliament, contempt for his colleagues and the Australian people. And it took three leadership battles for people to finally be worn down. And I think that's, that's the real story. The fact that... So, can, can, that, I, say, can yeah. I say, that may be the real story in to some to political professionals, but what do you think is going on with the polls? Because uh, you can't be delighted in the coalition to see him back level-pegging pretty much with you. Oh, look, 
Tony, polls will come and go, and closer to the election, they will um, they will bounce up and down. Uh, the point is... Well, you used to say that close to the election, they'll even out, but they've evened out a long way out from the election now. Yeah, well, let's, let's have an election date, which is what the Australian people want, because one thing, Kevin, coming back to the Prime Ministership has done is create greater confusion. At least people said, look, there's chaos, it's a circus in Canberra, but we know there's an election date and that's really good because we actually want a return to some <coughs> respectable stability and certainty and a government that we deserve. So, so, and Fair, the... so why is Kevin the preferred Prime Minister by that much? I think Kevin is the right person right now, but I think he should fully take advantage of the tall poppy syndrome, because we, he has been taken down and Australians don't like that, and he is now the underdog fighting. I, I just think the longer that goes on, the less credible that will be. But, but let's, I think go, that... let's go back to Sue's point, though, because it's a very important one. The polling has eaten things up. The two-party preferred is within... You know, it's almost 50-50. But Rudd has opened up overnight a 16-point lead over Tony Abbott, and that will have to or should actually change the plans of the of the coalition's Absolutely. approach to no, the election. Nothing changed. No, well, nothing's um, really changed because you've, you've got... Well, the a, polls a have third, changed, so well, something's the, changed. No, well, Tony, the polls have changed, but a third of the front bench, very experienced ministers, refused right. to serve with Kevin Wright. Okay. And, That's know, a, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you there because I'll, I'll bring you back in a moment. We haven't heard from Tanya Plibersek, and uh, let's hear what you think Kevin Look, Rudd should do to remake himself in his Mark II version. Um, the first thing I want to say is that it's really interesting as someone who's in the middle of it to hear different perspectives from outside it. And the thing that troubles me about the way the, that we're talking tonight is it's like, it's like people grading footballers or it's like people watching a sporting contest rather than making a decision about who's going to govern our nation. Who is best placed to deliver jobs? Who is best placed to run an education system? Who is best placed to deliver disability care? Who has led us out of the global financial crisis? These are the questions that we should be asking ourselves, not what someone's form like, what are we going to mark down on their scorecard? And I think that... So you didn't get rid of Julie Gillard because her scorecard fell with the polls? I mean, uh, this is what people have seen happen. Yeah. Look, you're doing a terrific job um, of papering over the cracks, but considering the questioner asked about all the dysfunctional uh, epithets and so on that were thrown uh, in his way by uh, members of your own Cabinet, you'd have to say this too. Um, with seven Cabinet members disappearing. If this was a sitting government well, and you lost seven Cabinet members, you wouldn't exist anymore. And, and I know each of those people who's going. And, you know, you take someone like Stephen Smith, for 20 years he has flown back and forward across the Nullarbor Plain. He's never been in the same time zone for three days in a row. There is only so long that you can do that. And if you haven't got fuel in the tank to keep doing it, then it, it's the right thing to do. But he's Greg actually, Conway, it, to be fair, he's still there. No, and the ones who are leaving the because election. they couldn't yep. work with Kevin Rudd and said so in advance, that's the rest of them. Uh, no, and that's actually not the case with all of them. There's a, a range of reasons that people are going. If someone has said previously, I can't work with this person and that person becomes leader, fair enough, you have to move on. But there's a range of reasons in that group for, for people moving on. And when... When you have a time of great flux, that's a time to go. I mean, that's, uh, it's a good opportunity to have part of the experienced team and new, fresh people who are full of enthusiasm to take us the next lap around the Oval. Let's go to our next question. It's from... Uh, I see the hand up there. We'll try and get a microphone to you in a minute. We've got a question from Terry Nutt. A question for Sophie, Tony. In the five days since the reinstallation of Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister, the ALP has made significant gains in the polls and the ALP have a real chance of winning the next election. Sophie, is it now time to dump Tony Abbott for Malcolm Turnbull? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll take that as a serious question. Uh, look... <laughs> Remember, it was Tony Abbott who got Kevin Rudd's measure and he was dumped and then Julia Gillard came along. It was Tony Rudd who got Julia Gillard's measure. If the Labor Party and Labor supporters are so confident that uh, Kevin um, resurrected is so great, call on an election and give the Australian people the ability to decide who will be Prime Minister. I do, th I do think Malcolm Turnbull is a very interesting product to sell because he is the most qualified 
unelectable person in Australia. <laughs> and, and, and as they say, you know, and because he, because we like the middle, and we don't like any outliers, especially white, rich, private school boys. So we don't like we don't like the outliers, and, and that's a shame because I actually think he's really qualified. But as they say, sorry, they're he both, can't, they're he, both white, rich, yes, uh, private but he school can't, boys. He can't be. I reckon they could run a campaign around this because he can't be elected, but he can be installed. So maybe what they should do is every vote for Tony is actually a vote for Malcolm. <laughs> I think you know, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, we've had the same. <laughs> team. It's an idea. Yeah, and 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 you sell those sort of. Crazy ideas. I think um, you're the one great. who sells crazy ideas. Well, <laughs> well actually, we've, we've had the same stable team since December 2009. Um, we've worked very hard to have um, the right policies and put to the Australian people. We're not the one who, who, are, who are divided and dysfunctional. There's, I mean, you look at someone like Wayne Swan. There are rumours in Canberra the only reason he's staying on is to make sure that Bill Shorten never becomes Prime Minister. The poison of the internecine warfare will continue. We're the ones who are ready and able to provide the Australian people the sort of government, the stability and the policies because, that they are asking for. Just because you're stable, though, doesn't mean you're good. Why don't we right? hear any of them? <laughs> I just want to pass this over to, uh, well, yes, let's, let's well, hear from Neil Lyons. Now, now the one thing that uh, Sophie is absolutely right about is that uh, they have had one leader for quite some time and he's basically uh, been such a good oppositionalist that he's done in two leaders already and now we're back to the first one again. But she's, and undoubtedly, she's, uh, I mean, hang on. She's, hang on, she's hang wrong on. about <laughs> the policies, though. They don't have any because they haven't expressed any in public so Do far. Oh, come on. <laughs> So, so, let's talk about Tony for a moment, because I think that was the question. No, let's talk and about I think policy. he has done... Oh, well, we'll get to you. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> you talking about policy would be great. But the question was about Tony Abbott, and I think he has done a very good job, and the party machine has done a very good job of remaking Tony Abbott. And he's presented as a much steadier character. He's really honed his skills, he's very predictable, he has his sort of lovely bedside manner in the way that he talks. He does always wear the same blue tie if he's not in the occasional lycra and budgie yeah. smuggler. But, but more seriously, it's clear that the framework the Coalition wants to take into this campaign is of stability versus chaos. And I think until last week they were just actually, he got into his stride and he was strolling to a, a certain victory. But I think it has been upset. But I, I think, yes, we need to talk about policy, and I think the Labor Party has a lot to talk about, but there's a lot of wounds to be healed. Yeah. You've opened up, I think Labor has opened up its backroom operations far too much. You know, it's said that you should never, if you want to eat sausages, never watch sausages being made. And at the moment, the Labor Party's all sausage and no skin. Yeah. Yeah. Sausages and laws, I think, is the expression mm. you never Let's hear from uh, right? Sue Cato on uh, the question that was asked, actually. Uh, and we did make the point that uh, Tony Abbott has done a remarkable job as an opposition leader. So that were, maybe the question was tongue-in-cheek about getting rid of him. I don't know. No, it's really interesting. I mean, when you come back and you look at who, who are the politicians, who are the personalities that are really rating and that people really care about. And, you know, you've raised Malcolm Turnbull. You look at Malcolm Turnbull and Kevin Rudd's popularity. And I think that's really a sign that people actually can see and make a choice on what they think is authentic and not authentic. And we've seen um, a lot of people feel that there are a lot of people delivering lines, delivering slogans, um, you know, the stunts, et cetera, going on. And I think that people are actually attracted to leaders who they think have a vision and who are above the day-in, day-out sort of brutality that this you know, last five years has become known for. And I think that's the reason why this change last week has changed the game. Yeah, I, I think the biggest risk right now to the Liberal Party, because they can't really walk it in anymore, I think the biggest risk is unscripted Tony. So the, the, challenge, the, the, the challenge that the Liberal Party had is that they didn't need to sell themselves. They needed to be careful not to unsell themselves. Mm. Now they have a problem because <laughs> you got Rudd who's come in and he's forcing policy conversations. So it'll be very interesting now to see Tony front more because I think they were using the George Bush strategy of keep him quiet because he's been off the radar. Yeah. We, I mean, George Bush didn't speak for two years unscripted. <laughs> and I think now he's going to have to go back. Actually, actually, let's look at the facts. 
Over the last 12 months, Tony Abbott's done twice as many interviews as Julia Gillard has done. Can you explain, why, can you explain why we don't he's see out... him doing long format interviews? Yeah. Why he won't do this program or Late Line or The Insiders? Well, he's done this program seven times. Kevin Rudd's done it four. Well, he hasn't since he's been leader. He's done it once. Well, he's done this program seven times. <laughs> Kevin Rudd's done it four. <laughs> and wasn't Kevin Rudd supposed to be on tonight? He's he was been... asked to be on tonight and he refused to do it. Well, Tony no, Abbott's been asked to be on many times as tonight. well. That's not the point. The point is, we want to know when he will actually come out and start doing long format interviews where he will test himself. Because if Todd is right and he stays under the radar, that's going to be a problem for him. I want to hear him speak because he's, he's very out entertaining. There. He's out there. <laughs> Last week, he did more interviews over the last week than both Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard did together. Why won't, he, why won't he debate the Prime Minister at the press club on the economy? Let's let Kevin Rudd call an election and why? we'll have those. Why? And we will have. You asked me a question, Tanya. Let me answer it. Let Kevin Rudd either recall Parliament, let's have debates, let him call an election and we'll have those candidate debates and bring it on. Why, did Ke why is Kevin Rudd not calling Kevin Rudd an election? Uh, don't, be, don't be ridiculous. Don't well, be ridiculous. When will it happen then, Sophie? Why is Kevin Rudd afraid to call an election day? Does he think the longer he keeps it, he can have a, a greater victory? I mean, do, does I he does he think that? According to the that? polls, it's not okay. a bad idea. Well, I'm, great. I'm gonna, call gonna, it on. Sorry, Bring I'm, it on. I'm Bring gonna, on, I'm gonna, Bring on the we, election. We've made that point a few times now. Um, let's go to Marla Minow with her question. Um, hi, for the entire panel, actually, I'd be interested to know what each of you think um, are the top two substantive things that either Kevin Rudd or the Labor Party need to do to win the next election. Yeah, Neil Lawrence, let's start with you. It's, we're back I, to policy now. Are there policy shifts that Rudd should move to quickly? I think the first, the first one that springs to mind is on, on refugee policy. Um, you know, the, the first thing that Tony Abbott and, and the Coalition have said in their mantra in the last election, I'm sure they will in this, is stop the boats. And they have got a lot of traction with that, particularly in the west of Sydney and other areas, and there's going to be a response from Labor. I hope... Um, and this is a hope rather than advice, that it's not the lurch to the left or the lurch to the right, but actually a lurch towards a more humanitarian statement of the issue that is really restated as Australia's humanitarian response to, to refugees and not framed in this awful frame that debate sits in terms of border protection and this ridiculous notion we're hearing now about securing our borders, as if Australia's borders needed to be secured. I find... So I'm, I'm a little concerned about the, the language coming out of Labor now about economic refugees, and it seems to be a way of leering them into that debate. But I think it will be critical in this election campaign. It isn't set, their response. I hope that they can actually reframe the debate to, as I said, talk about our a proper and more, a kinder and gentler approach and language about <coughs> refugees rather than that which exists at the moment. Good luck with that. I think, uh, they should, I think they should ban it. I think it shouldn't be allowed to be used. I think it's pathetic and embarrassing that the politicians dehumanise these people and toy with them politically for their own gains. We know that, in de you know, indefinite... <laughs> We know that indefinite incarceration of children is wrong. Everybody knows that. Indefinite incarceration of children is wrong. And we also know if someone came to our house and they were hurt and they were fleeing persecution, we'd let them in. It's un-Australian not to. I think we should ban it from, from the election because it's going to be a big hot button You used. can't really ban free speech. Mm. That is a bit of an issue. Um, Sue Cato, uh, let's hear from you. And, and bear in mind this, since we're talking about this, um, Bob Carr came out um, actually on the night of the, uh, of the coup and said that nine out of 10, in fact, he, he extended this to 100% of recent arrivals are economic migrants and that the tribunal that assesses whether people are refugees or not needs to be much tougher. Um, and that's where they'll be looking clearly. Uh, what do you think? Look, I mean, clearly it's an issue that um, both parties are going to have to take a clear position with to the polls. Uh, clearly the opposition, um, having stopped the boats, has been enormously effective in the electorates that matter to them. Um, I think for a lot of us, we stand back and we say, this is a pretty big country. How many people are really coming to Australia? Um, it's, you know, I, we've had this debate many times. And I think, um, you know, it is such a difficult political 
question for both parties. There is no right answer for them if they want to have electoral success in well, the Well, Bob Carr seems to be one. redefining the argument <laughs> as to who really is or is not a refugee. It's really interesting, but if you actually get back to winning the election, and that, to Todd's point, is, is the issue, it would be terrific if it wasn't going to be politicised, but both parties are going to have to come to a landing and there's going to be pain wherever that landing is. But I think what Kevin Rudd has done... Um, with his comments of last week of the potential conflict in Indonesia, is actually take the debate into, into a different area, rightly or wrongly. We're actually starting to look at the politics, or you know, a lot of people have looked at the politics, but we're really talking about the politics of the region. OK, I'm going to interrupt you there, in. because we actually have a question on that subject, then I'll bring in the politicians. It's from Paul Barham. Kevin Rudd says that uh, Tony Abbott's asylum seeker policy could start a conflict with Indonesia. Did he consult with the Defence and Foreign Affairs Departments and his colleagues before making such an inflammatory announcement? If not, are we seeing the same old Kevin Rudd not consulting and making things up on the fly? Tanya Plibersek. Well, it wasn't a policy announcement. It was a view that he was giving in a press conference. And if he did consult with the National Security Committee, um, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'd be breaking the law if I did. Um, I think it's very clear that Kevin has certainly learnt from the past. Um, I was at the beginning of the uh, Cabinet meeting today, but I had to finish to come here, and we had a very, uh, very good and important discussion about the way forward. And I think a lot of us see a, a very genuine desire and intention there to have a more collegiate system of Cabinet. But, you know... The other thing that I was thinking about today as we were sitting around the Cabinet table, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Disability Care, started today, first day. That's an idea that came out of the 2020 summit. That was the time that it was first raised. It's one of the things that Sophie and her colleagues made fun of at the time, proving that it was, you know, government by thought bubble and so on. We now see the fruits of that years later in a program that will be as big a change and as important for Australia as Medicare has been to our history. So I think that there's um, something quite wonderful about having big ideas for the country, and I'm really proud of that. I'm just going to take you back to the question. In fact, the, uh, the, the questioner was... You've well, started, you know, you started yeah. to answer the, the point. The, the answer is, and you were, and, if and, it was sorry. discussed at the National Security Committee, I would have to kill you if I told you. <laughs> we don't really That's want not good you... policy. <laughs> we don't want you killing, <laughs> don't you killing audience members. <laughs> yeah. um, let me just ask you this. You were talking about sitting around the Cabinet table discussing yeah. asylum seeker policy, which is obviously very high on the no, agenda. Do, I, do you I agree... I didn't say that we were doing do that. Do you agree with Bob Carr that the vast majority of recent arrivals are economic migrants? Um, I'll tell you what I would say, Tony. I'd say that when we've got uh, 13,500 places moving up to 20,000 places, I want to make sure that the people that get those places are the ones in the greatest need. And I think about, um, in particular, um, women uh, and children uh, in conflict zones in Africa who, without us going to those countries and finding them in the refugee camps and offering them a way of coming to Australia, they won't get here. So I think we need a program that does ensure that we pick up the people most in need. Yeah, but that really didn't answer the question. Do you agree that the recent arrivals on boats, Bob Carr says, they are 100% well, economic migrants? Look, He I, went to Indonesia and he said that. I, I, um, I think that there is always a range of people who are seeking our protection. Uh, I think um, the vast majority are found to be genuine and some are not, and we need to make sure that those who are not are returned as quickly as possible so that the places that we do have go to the people most in need. But, OK, I'm just going to go back to what Bob Carr I said. I'm not going to give you a running commentary on everything my colleagues say at every press conference they do, Tony. It's well, just... it, it was not only a press conference, but an interview straight after the leadership <laughs> queue. He was obviously putting this on the table, and it's open for debate, it seems to me, once he's put it on the table. He says 100% of recent arrivals well, are economic migrants and the tribunal system is broken and needs to be fixed. Is he right? Is he wrong? It's not my view that 100% of recent arrivals are economic refugees. OK, let's go to Sophie. <laughs> and uh, the question um, that was asked up there was about the comments about uh, what well, the tow-back-the-boats policy would cause conflict with Indonesia. Well... 
Expert commentators have said, and I have to agree with them, that it was an absolutely reckless mistake to make. I mean, having said that he believed in turning back the boats, then coming to office and dismantling the policies that actually did stop the boats, which is the most humane thing to do to stop deaths at sea, Kevin Rudd can't take responsibility for being the architect of the current mess we have with over 45,000 illegal arrivals and over 700 boats. So instead of coming up with a solution, the very cunning tactic is to come up with this outrageous statement that there's going to be armed conflict with Indonesia. It is irresponsible, it is absurd and it is wrong. And the real question is, um, does the Labor Party really believe it can stop the boats? Oops. I don't think they can. And in the absence of a policy aimed at actually stopping the boats and the deaths at sea, there is just this ridiculous, absurd, irresponsible statement um, by the, the now Labor Prime Minister. But, but Sophie, is it any more... <laughs> but, is it, but is it any more irresponsible than positioning refugees as attacking our country and thousands and thousands of them trying to get well, in? Well, claiming that's, that's that you not can what we've stop, done. That, claiming that you can stop those, we, claiming that you can But we can... Tan, uh, I think, Tanya, the problem Indonesia is that... that. The, the, the problem the is... the question, isn't the, it? We're not going to stop the boats. Tanya, we want to help the, people. The, Tanya, the problem is that in the coalition, we actually believe we can stop the boats and it happened before. The problem is in your heart of hearts, mm. so many of you in the Labor Party don't believe you can stop the boats and perhaps you don't want to. That's the real difference. OK, I'm just going to go to Neil Lawrence. Listening to this discussion and to the question, um, it was specifically about what Kevin Rudd said about conflict with Indonesia. Did he make a blunder uh, when he said that? Was it a deliberate, calculated statement? Um, is it possible there could be conflict? Uh, Look, I'm not a foreign policy expert. I don't think it is possible um, on anything. I can imagine that there will be conflict. Um, whether it was calculated or not, I can't tell. I'm not inside Kevin Rudd's head, and it's probably not a bad thing. But um, <laughs> I, I, it, it felt to me like a bit of overreach. I, I want to know, um, Tony, why, when Sophie talks like that, why her party didn't support the arrangement that we made with Malaysia? Why you wouldn't vote for that? Well, Tanya, it wasn't a solution. It wasn't um, uh, supposedly resettling 800 people is not a solution. You wanted the humane solution. You probably didn't even support that particular policy. It was not a total solution. You know they not weren't a total signatories. Solution. They weren't. Um, they weren't signatories to the UN Convention. And the reality what is, what do you, you don't... care about that, Sophie? Really? Excuse me. <laughs> Tanya, there's no, there's no need to be nasty. There's no need to be okay, nasty. Okay, I think I'll just move this on to our next question. It is from Gary O'Sullivan. Uh, my question's for Todd Sampson, Neil Lawrence and Sue Cato. Uh, Australian politics has become dramatically more personality-driven and presidential in style over recent years. Uh, long gone are the days when we'd hear uh, the Labor Party or the Labor government or the Liberal government in any public statement Today it's always about the Rudd government or the Howard government. Um, leaders speak, you know, my government will do this, I will do that. Um, last week we saw the Labor leader and Prime Minister toppled because of poor polling, not poor, not poor leadership. Uh, do you accept that this change has been driven largely by the spin doctors, the pollsters, the advertising and marketing world, mm. and that government in Australia is the poorer for it? Yeah. So, with Todd. Go ahead. Uh, I agree. Uh, I, I think that the, one of the main issues with political advertising in, in Australia is the populist move to the middle. So both parties have, are kind of shifting slightly to the right, slightly to the left of the middle. And really, I mean, I don't follow either party, but, but the, if you look at them, the only difference between Liberal and Labour is the size of the L, really. It's not, oh. there's, not, there's not that much. <laughs> as a result of that, as a result of that lack of differentiation between the two of them, they go to personality politics. And personality politics is, in my opinion, is irritating and a waste of time because all people really want to hear are what they're paid to do, which is put the policies forward, let us debate those policies, and then make a decision. Neil. Um, 
Look, leadership is, is, is always going to be very important and, and, and people look very much to who is going to be leading the party. It's, it's true here. I think it's true in most democracies around the world. I think there has been a narrowing, um, uh, an exaggeration of it, and a narrowing of, of focus in election campaigns. Uh, people don't have very much time, and especially the, the people in the middle that uh, Todd is talking about, if you like, the swing voter is often very disengaged, very hard to get to, and I think that probably as much as anything else has driven um, the leadership and the leaders being, being thrust forward. It's an easier thing to get a handle on and people do make up their minds, uh, whether it's a good thing or not, very much on who's leading the party. So, Cato. It's interesting, I almost feel like I should have bought my black hat, you know, being one of these evil spin doctors. But I think you've also got to give some, with this responsibility all over the place. I mean, you know, we work with um, our leaders, our clients, whatever. And, and, you know, for instance, we saw the episode uh, in the last couple of weeks of the, um, the Women's Weekly shot of Julia Gillard. Um, you know, the prime or the ex-prime minister actually had an opportunity to say, "This is actually really absurd. I don't want to be part of this." <coughs> you know, we, we elect these people to be our leaders. They've got to take responsibility for their actions. The fact that so many of uh, our leaders are now, to your point, hooked on the polls, I think, is why we're getting these 50-50 outcomes. You know, I think, you know, I said a little earlier. You know, people were responding to Rudd. And, and Malcolm Turnbull because they were taking it above the fray and having a larger vision. Now, their own parties punished them for doing that because that was, you know, that was difficult and didn't fit with it. But, you know, I'd love someone to take a risk. I'd like someone to take, you know, to take a position but that we actually had enough faith and belief in them that they were able to actually say, you know, you're not going to like this, but let me tell you why you're going to do it. And we're lacking that bravery. And, you know, I might be sort of, you know, wickedly idealistic, but I want actually a really brave leader again, not, not someone who's going to give us this rotten sort of minority government where, you know, it's not our fault that we can't decide who we want to lead us because no one gives us a clear enough view of who we should back. OK, I'm going to interrupt and I'll bring the politicians in in a minute, but uh, we've got a video question that's on this subject. You're watching Q&A. Remember, you can send your web or video questions, or web or video questions to our website. Uh, the address is on the screen if you want to work out how to do that. Our next question is a video. It's from uh, Terence Hewton in Henley Beach, South Australia. Former ABC Current Affairs reporter Maxine McHugh found herself on the altar in a Gillard Labor government because she refused to fall into line with the PR <coughs> dictates of the party machine. Under a reformed Rudd government, do you think there will now be a place for genuine politicians who reject spin and who simply want to tell it like it is without deceit and manipulation? Or is this a hopelessly idealistic expectation belonging to a bygone era in politics and utterly out of step with the Orwellian realities of electioneering in the new millennium. <laughs> How do you feel uh, Well, I think that was a, a, a terrific question. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> you might want to have a crack at answering it. Um, well, I don't know what the question really is. The, if, is the que <laughs> no, if, if the question is, can we be ourselves, I think the answer is yes. I've been in Parliament for 15 years and I think um, my colleagues and my constituents and the people I deal with have a pretty clear idea of who I am and what I stand for. And sometimes that fits in with, you know, what the, what's happening with the rest of the party and sometimes it's in conflict and you have to work when you're an individual who's part of a team, have to work out how you, how you make good decisions collectively that um, cover the cross-section of views and values that we have in any collection of people. But is this where Julia Gillard came a cropper? I mean, we all remember um, the sort of spin-driven rhetoric and then it's, I'm going to be the real Julia from now on. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's... Uh, people... so... when, when things are going smoothly, people say, oh, everything's too media-managed. And then there's a few hiccups and they go, it's chaos, it's chaos, you know, run for the hills. The, the, and so you the, did. Part of... <laughs> There's, a, there's another Part point of, that, sorry... I, I was just going to say, Neil, that our, our job as parliamentarians uh, is to say, 
this is how we're running the country. This is what we're doing right now. These are our successes. These are our plans for the future. And, um, and part of that is telling the truth well. It's um, having a plan, being able to describe it, but explaining to people why you think your vision is the one that takes the country forward. Is that spin? I, I think that that's just good communication. Sophie Mirabella. I, I don't hold out much hope with uh, Kevin's resurrection because it was Stephen Smith who actually said in criticising Kevin, you can't run a country by looking at the front page of the newspaper. You can't deal with national security and economic security when you do that. And that was part of the problem and the frustration that the Cabinet had first time round. And I think that's going to continue because that's um, how Kevin has operated. That's how he continues to operate. He hasn't given, you know, in-depth interviews or detailed well, policy this yet. Is and a part bit of rich the from well, the party of the well, this three is, words this is slogan, your slogan, Sophie. This is, but this is what Tony this is, is what Stephen Smith. The three word slogan. Hold on. This is what Stephen Smith himself has said. This is what your colleagues have said about. <laughs> the man that took three leadership ballots to finally uh, get the job back. This is the man who stalked Julia for three years, um, undermined, undermined her at the last election, continued to undermine, using all sorts of spin and popping up in the media here, zipping off there. I mean, that's that's how he got the job. So I can I just ask one? Can, can, just, can, I just put one thing, can I just put one thing uh, to yeah. you? And that is, uh, was I think you were about to say, he rolled um, Malcolm Turnbull. I mean, it's not Hold the on, only there's one. There's a difference and, and between. Was, 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 was Malcolm was there? Your own I, I was, was Malcolm there. Turnbull no, no, stalked no, no. Uh, by no, people who didn't like him? He wasn't stalked. There is a difference. There is a difference between. Um, leadership challenges and Kevin. What Kevin has done, I mean, what Kevin has done has been quite extraordinary. Sophie, and and, and a there's question. a very, very big, very, very big difference. But Sophie, question. I mean, we come back to um, when I um, interrupted you last time. Apologies. But, you know, we've heard all of this about Kevin Rudd. We've had uh, demonisation of him by all sorts of people. We've had, to your point, Tony Abbott having a clear run for all of this period. I don't think there's anyone in this audience, or anyone in the country, who hasn't been keeping up with the soap opera. Mm. Why is he so popular? Why is he the most popular leader in the country? But, but Sue, I can understand, um, you know, friends of his, such as yourself, believing that. But I actually travelled across the... This is like political America. tennis. I'm getting hit. Like... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, 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 I know... No, no, for I, the polls well, don't you've lie. You've asked me a question. I know, okay. the polls don't lie and you're not answering it. You're putting more... You're putting well, if you believe it. he's so popular, as his friend, convince him to hold an election as soon as possible. I think, okay, bring all right, it all right, on. Okay, that is a point. No, Tony, 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 let me answer that. Let me answer it. No, Neil, let me answer it. That's a ridiculous position to take, So What, to have an election? No, 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 wait for a moment. I mean, it's a... I spent... I actually don't back away from one moment that the Rudd family are very old friends of mine, but I actually grew up in student politics and youth politics and probably a huge period of misspent youth. And I actually have friends right across the political spectrum, including a lot of your colleagues. I actually am in a luxurious position of not being owned by a party or being, you know, of a party that I can actually back and believe in people who I think have got policies. And there are plenty of people right across the Greens, everywhere else, who I think are doing a great job. Right. Kevin okay. Rudd is, is very popular. I mean, those polls, and he has been consistently, and it puzzles a lot of people, and, and I worked with him for a whole election campaign. It puzzled me for a while. But, you know, he, obviously he's very bright, he's a very good campaigner and has a singular self-belief. But that doesn't, that doesn't mark him out from <laughs> other politicians right, like Malcolm Turnbull. But the mistake you continue to make, and I think a lot of people inside the Labor Party are underestimating him, um, and the mistake the Liberal Party's now making with the ads they're running, trying to, to be very negative again and poison that well, is it hasn't worked. It is not the view of the Australian people. My theory on it, for what it's worth, is that Rudd's an outsider. In that challenge that happened last week, it was interesting, you know, Julia came with a, a phalanx of people, mm. and that's uncommon. You saw Rudd walking on his own, lone wolf style. He was an outsider in his childhood, through his career, and he has been inside the party. And a lot of people in this country out identify with that. And the more you try and belt him down, the more they're identifying with it. He's like the outsider's insider. Yeah, but and it's not our I think that's one words. of the keys it's to him. Not, we're not no, demonising him. But what you it's... think doesn't matter. What the Australian people does think, he's opened up a sizeable lead over your well... leader and it's going to have a big effect on this campaign. OK, I'm going to just interrupt again to go to our next question. It's from Belinda Ramsey. 
Todd Sampson, you recently tweeted that politics today is so painful, it's become the NRL of the intelligentsia. <laughs> Considering the significant turmoil faced by political infighting and the media's negative reporting of the political arena, I asked the panel, why would you encourage young people to pursue political careers in their future? Todd. Oh, but there was a panel, was that to me? Uh, uh, Belinda, I think it's a very good question, and I think at the way we behave, stabbing our leaders, sticking our leaders, leaders not putting policy up, yelling at each other, making fun of each other, rampant sexism throughout politics and the media, I don't know why young people would actually go into politics. I wish the good ones would, though. I feel very differently. I feel the opposite. I think, you know, people have gone into politics, good people have gone into politics because they've seen wrongs they wanted to right or good things they wanted to achieve. And I, I would hope that's your response and other young people. I think it is, it's, it's very noticeable that this generation, you know, 16 to 28, about that age, have disengaged. I understand why, but I really hope that doesn't continue. Yeah. Um, if the, you know, and, and particularly people, and I know a lot of uh, young women have been upset about the treatment of Julia, and if you think that's the case, it's a good reason to go in and get involved, not to run away from it. Tanya Plibersek, uh, let me bring you in on that, because Kevin Rudd has said he wants to re-engage young, disengaged people. Um, you know, was, was getting rid of a female Prime Minister the way to do that? Um, I actually want to answer this question more directly. Uh, the answer is because if you don't fight, the bad people win. Mm. And uh, in, in terms of um, a, a career of service, it is one of the most rewarding things that you could ever hope to do with your life. And just a few weeks ago, we opened a fantastic new $16 million facility for frail aged homeless people in my electorate in Redfern, people who would have been sleeping rough sometimes for 10 years, 15 years. That would not have happened without the Labor government that I was part of and it would, wouldn't have happened if I didn't do the homelessness white paper when I had the homelessness portfolio. There is nothing you can do in life that compares with that feeling of satisfaction. I'm just going to go, uh, I'll bring you in, uh, Sophie, because there is a question directly to you, and that question is from Helga Burns. Yes, my question is to Sophie. Um, Sophie, as a leading female parliamenta uh, parliamentarian who has witnessed at, at first hand the, uh, and and the well-documented misogynist and sexist abuse of our first female Prime Minister, how would you advise young women contemplating a political career, career in our country to overcome these shameful uh, attitudes from our parliamentarians? Well, I, I don't accept a, a lot of those uh, premises. There's, there's a lot um, that <coughs> has gone on in politics that will continue to get on. It always has been. It's not that now is a particularly uh, more brutal time in politics. If you go through Hansard, if you look at what happens... Uh, I, I, I disagree with Tanya on one point, and that is you've got to get involved because the bad guys win. I don't think it's about that. I think it is about believing in what can bring out the possibilities of our nation, of our, of our people. What can we do to make this country a better place, that to give people... Well, well, well my, my question co was you, being yeah. a female uh, parliamentarian, mm -hmm a well-known female male parliamentarian, you would have witnessed it firsthand, and well, it's been well documented in the in the newspapers uh, everywhere. Are you, are you, can I just interrupt? Are you talking specifically about uh, Julia Gillard and what's been said about her? No, I'm talking about well, yes, but it's a general it's a general uh, trend uh, in, in, with politicians. I guess yes, it has been very pointed with Julia Gillard. That's for sure. But I'm sure that um, that sort of attitude comes through uh, in a lot of areas, especially... Well, well, you don't accept it. I mean, I, I've faced some, some particular incidents and... You the, haven't heard the comments? Well, the, the, the worst um, incident I faced, which can only be thrown at a woman, is yeah. evil thoughts will turn your child into a demon. Now, I didn't claim misogyny, I didn't play, claim foul, but I was bitterly disappointed that neither the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister at the time said that was unacceptable behaviour. I was disappointed that none of the women in the Labor Party said that was unacceptable. 
I've been called a bitch in the parliament. I've, I've, I've it's been said that I, by a Labor candidate well, running that's what against I mean. me. I didn't yeah, say but, Labor or Labor. Tell you, no, no, I'll I tell said you, generally yeah, sure. politicians. And I've been, um, I've been, uh, it's been said that I couldn't represent my electorate because I didn't have a husband and children at the time. And Julie Gillard still came to my electorate and campaigned for this fellow. I think what you have to do You're is supporting believe, what I'm believe, um, uh, believe strongly enough in the, the values and ideas <coughs> you think uh, this country should adopt and will take this country well, forward. Well, Sophie, what, I'm, what I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you for a minute and yeah. I'll just follow up with Sophie. I mean, yeah. uh, one of your senators, Michaela Cash, um, mm. uh, made a pretty passionate, sort of weirdly passionate, actually, um, <laughs> denunciation of the sisterhood for stabbing Julia Gillard in the back, uh, suggesting that they were now drinking from the chalice of blood, etc., <laughs> etc. I mean, it was pretty over the top. But, I mean, uh, is that, is, do, you, do you actually think um, that Julia Gillard was made a scapegoat for... Uh, the fact that she was a female Prime Minister? I don't think Julia's problems stemmed from the fact that she was a female. Uh, yes, there are differences. I know a lot of people, men, who voted for her in 2010 because they thought a woman would be different in politics and then they were subsequently disappointed. But I don't think that's the so that was the source of her problems. Uh, I think um, you have to go back at... The actual election in 2010, Kevin Rudd's destabilisation, the broken promises throughout her term and the fatal, fatal mistake of entering into partnership um, with the Greens and independents and the sort of government that delivered. When you had Labor members of caucus being utterly ignored because the, the Greens and the independents so that were pandered is just to... not true. Well, do you speak it's to... It's just well, not Tanya, true. Tanya, I've spoken to your colleagues. You're not there when I have conversations with them. Uh, I You're doubt not many there. of my colleagues okay. spend a lot of time yeah. with you, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I can tell you this. Uh, Tony Windsor, Rob Oakeshott, all of them say that Tony Abbott was desperate to form government, that he would have done anything to form government. And the reason they went with Julia Gillard as Prime Minister is because she offered them better negotiation, better stability, better cons consultation. Now, at that time, you said that the government wouldn't last three weeks. We lasted now three years. We passed 590 pieces of legislation, important things like disability reform, like the education reform, so it'll deliver extra funding to our schools. We've created almost a million jobs since coming to government. I mean, these are huge achievements. And They've been done at a time when there has been an unprecedented level of negativity and hostility and opposition that has not once said, yes, in the national interests, we agree with that. That's we'll incorrect. vote with you. It's, it does We've sound... Can I, can I just interrupt for one second? It does sound like... Um... You're suggesting a remarkably good record for Julia Gillard's government, so the question is, why did you get rid of it? Well, it has been a good record, and I think we're very fortunate that we've had, in our time in government between 2007 and now, two intelligent, hard-working, decent people yeah, but why, that we've but been why, able to look up why, to I as mean, leaders. The, the question well, that's been raised there is about misogyny. Julie Gillard raised it herself. Did the coup against Julie Gillard have anything to do with sexism and misogyny? Uh, I don't think the change in leadership is about sexism and misogyny, but I think that Julia Gillard experienced sexism during her time as Prime Minister without doubt, and I think that some of the things that were said about her were foul and unforgivable. OK. So can I just ask you, why did you get rid of her? Um, it was a, it, was it, because was it a case of what she said when she took over from Kevin Rudd, a good government that lost its way? Because we are a democracy and she stood and the majority of my colleagues uh, um, decided that a change of leadership was necessary. It was a democracy that Kevin Rudd didn't like the answer to, so he kept going back for more, back for more, um, back for more. Um, the reason why... Um, the, the main so reason that Kevin so Rudd gave Howard, for people to vote to for him, too, the main reason... <laughs> uh, the main reason why okay. Kevin Rudd convinced his Cabinet colleagues was because he was against something. He wanted to stop Tony Abbott. And it's all very, very negative. Instead of saying what he wanted to do for the nation, the main 
main reason, the main argument used with caucus colleagues was, I've got a better chance of stopping Tony Abbott. It was as simple people, as that. People know what he wants to yeah. do. We want to we want to price carbon. We want to have a strong economy. We want to have a fair society. We want to introduce disability care. We want to transform our nation's school. We're rolling out the NBN so homes and businesses can be transformed. What is your policy for the future, Sophie? What does the Liberal Party stand for today? What do you stand for? Well, we, we, we can go through it. Well, we don't... We, there is a very big difference between the Labor Party and the Coalition. Do you, um, do you have... Them, very simply, though, do you have a list like that of... Of uh, course we do. We've got the Real Solutions booklet. There's over 52 oh, policies. Like over 52... Poli oh, no, Tanya. I mean, there are over 52 policies. We actually do want jobs growth. As the Shadow Minister for Industry, I know firsthand, visiting over 300 factories, why the carbon tax has exported jobs and emissions. Well, has 150,000 jobs created since carbon pricing was well, introduced. Well, let me tell you about manufacturing jobs, Tanya. Under, <laughs> under this government... Under this government, we've seen one manufacturing job lost every 19 minutes. We've seen a red tape exponentially increase. We have seen the That's competitiveness... Right. Sorry? That's not right. No, it's not right. It's, it's just another it's, slogan. You can just get on national TV and say, that's not right. It's no, just you don't another know. slogan. And, and, you think, and, and you think that's OK. Mm. And you think you can just get away with it, Tanya. The reality is... you really not like each other, that <laughs> Hold on. The reality is we do have a plan. We have a plan for jobs, and that is getting rid of the carbon tax. It is getting rid of a billion dollars of red so tape. So you lose all the green it energy jobs. It is stopping straight away. It is stopping. Um, it is stopping the boats because we actually believe in stopping them. And the problem is, Tanya, if Julie Gillard's record was so good. Why did you get rid of it and why won't you go straight okay, to the Okay, we'll an leave that rhetorical question hanging in the air. We've got time for <laughs> one last question. It's from Chris Donoghue. Yeah, g'day, guys. Um, <laughs> so, thank you for a great episode, by the way. Over the past six months, I have felt that the majority of mainstream media has helped propel a negative image of Julia Gillard, explicitly or otherwise. The moment the media began reporting about internal divisions which have nothing to do with policy, the polls went down and the me media began reporting about the decline in her popularity, thus causing a vicious cycle that her public image could not recover. Was she a victim of the 24-hour news cycle and the hype of the headline? Neil Lawrence, let's start with you. I think uh, anyone that saw Annabelle Crabbe and Lee Sales on their stoic effort when, before the, the vote came in the other night, may have heard Annabelle's, I thought, great rant, and I use the word positively, against uh, the proliferation of polls and the degree to which, particularly our newspapers, have become reliant on them for, for generating stories. So I think there's quite a lot in, that I would agree with in what you're suggesting. I think it's overdone, they're, they're overcooked. And, and overly sensationalised. That said, do I think that it was the polls in the 24-hour news cycle that caused the problems that, that Gillard ended up having? Uh, no, not. I don't think that was the prime driver. They sort of echoed it, they exaggerated it. But there were, a, you know, a series of, of errors that compounded along the way that were real, not, not manufactured by mm. polls. So, so Kate, first. And while we'd all like a um, sort of gentler, more loving panel here. Um, you know, you live by the sword and you die by the sword. So if you're out there and you're playing the media and you're working at 24 hours and if you do something that doesn't work, justice or you might call it an injustice, but it's swift. We've got a very, very sophisticated and very actorate, um, um, active electorate now. People who will voice their opinion in a heartbeat. So if you do something that we think is inauthentic, that we think is a stunt. You know, we have all lost our sense of humour over the last five years. I mean, we're watching the biffo on this panel and there are a lot of people who I guarantee would have said, eh, not too much of that. So I think that, um, you know, at the moment, the disengagement for young people and, and so many people being turned off is because the media... You can say, you know, uh, you know, they were 24 seven to fill. You know, every day the newspapers and the, the websites start effectively empty and they've got to be filled up. You know, politics tries to fill them and you play the game and you get burnt. Mm. Todd. I, I think Julia, to answer your question on Julia, I think Julia was very, very carefully repositioned 
uh, externally by the master of negative spin, Tony Abbott, and internally by the master of controlled anger, uh, Kevin Rudd. And I think that, and I think that she suffers from, she suffered from both of those. But uh, my own personal uh, view Tom, did is... Did John McTernan have anything to do with it? Potentially. Uh, my, my own personal... John McTernan being Julia Gillard's spin doctor, effectively. Yes. We should get rid of him as well. But uh, <laughs> my own view is if you can't vote for either of these and we're not going to do anything about climate change, then I'm voting for Clive Palmer because I want to get on that boat. <laughs> now, that boat... Lest I'm you on forget, the boat. Lest you forget, that boat is the Titanic. Yes. Tenia <laughs> um, <laughs> Um I can't remember the question. <laughs> the question um, was whether... We, where uh, we whether into the 24 well, I mean, let me, let me put it this way. Yeah. Um, your former Minister for, Telecom oh, for Communications, Stephen Conroy, blamed uh, News Limited newspapers for just about every evil that befell uh, him and the government. Um, so I guess the yeah. question is, did newspapers have anything to do with the demise of Julie Gillard? Uh, I think is Stephen a, Conroy right? There's a, there's a pretty clear editorial line in News Limited papers at the moment, but... Um, I think uh, Tony Blair said something like complaining about the media is like complaining about the weather. It might make you feel better briefly, but it doesn't actually change anything. So it, it is our um, responsibility to work with the tools that we've got and we need to find a way of communicating with people. It's great if that's through free media, newspapers, television, radio. Uh, if it's not, then it has to be talking more directly. It, it's more door knocking, more electronic <laughs> communication, whatever way we've got of talking to people directly. Sophie Mirabello, we've got just a couple of seconds, really. The availability of more news mediums and the 24-hour news cycle should present an opportunity to actually sell a government's message, to be able to sell the policies, sell the vision. But in the absence of that, um, if there, a government is uh, <coughs> divided and there is great confusion, the void will be filled by those wishing to push um, the particular line that um, they're taking in their particular faction in, in a civil war within a party. And perhaps Sophie, that's I, what happened. We, we, we've got to wind yeah. up, but just a quick question there. Does it help when uh, Rupert Murdoch is on your side? <laughs> I'll take that as a rhetorical question. OK, no, that's probably, all we're... probably not as much as the ABC being on your side. All right, well, that's all we have time for tonight. Please <laughs> thank our panel, Sophie Mirabella, Todd Sampson, Neil Lawrence, <laughs> Tanya Plibersek <laughs> and Sue Cato. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this... Thursday night. Kevin Rudd is in Jakarta and so are we. Broadcasting live our first overseas Q&A with a panel of Indonesia's leading thinkers, political commentators and journalists. They'll face an audience of Indonesians and Australians and discuss a sometimes strained relationship with our nearest neighbour. So join us for Q&A Jakarta on Thursday night at 9.30pm. Then the next Monday night we'll be back here in Australia and here in Sydney in fact with the new Deputy Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. The Coalition's Malcolm Turnbull, the Australian's cartoonist Bill Leake, the writer and comedian Corinne Grant, and uh, that's all for the time being, but until then, good night.